I must emphasize that even though uh, I'm very optimistic, I don't rule out war in some areas, for example. Uh, there could easily be another war in Gaza. Uh, there will be continuing conflict in Iraq. There will be continuing conflict in Syria. It can happen, by the way. Eh? But what's remarkable is that, you know, there are some hot spots in this region. I'll give you an example. As recently as 1996, 18 years ago, President Bill Clinton sent two aircraft carriers towards the Straits of Taiwan because there was tension within Taiwan and China. Today, the prospects of war with Taiwan and China are practically zero. See how the world has changed. Mm -hmm. That's a concrete example of a hot geopolitical flashpoint 18 years ago that has now calmed down dramatically, right? So that's one example. But in the case of Singapore, by the way, what Singapore needs to worry about, the number one worry for Singapore is a lonely, self-radicalized jihadist terrorist who carries a suicide belt on him and goes to Raffles Place and blows himself up. And that's something that virtually no intelligence agency can prevent because this is one individual acting on his own without leaving a signature trail that intelligence agency can pick up. So that's the kind of danger we have. We will not have drones coming to Singapore because Singapore technologically has the best armed forces in Southeast Asia. Nobody comes close to Singapore in terms of technological development. So actually, the more high-tech the threat is, the better Singapore is prepared. The more low-tech the threat is, the more dangerous it is for Singapore. The good news for Singapore, and this is one of the things that many people in the world are not aware of, that is just that ASEAN is a remarkable organization. It has performed many geopolitical miracles that the world doesn't know about. The first geopolitical miracle is that ASEAN is the most diverse region in, on our entire planet. Out of 600 million people in ASEAN, you have 250 million Muslims, 100 million Christians, 80 million Mahayana Buddhists, 150 million Hinayana Buddhists, and then you have Taoists, Confucianists, or even Communists in Southeast Asia. And yet, this most diverse region is at peace. So ASEAN has developed an institutional culture that enables it to bring peace to a region. But more importantly, you know the annual ASEAN meetings, mm -hmm which are talk shops, which are very boring meetings. But these boring meetings, the boring meetings to the lay people, are actually fundamental in trying to preserve peace because they provide opportunities for United States and China to talk to each other, for China and Japan to talk to each other, for China and India to talk to each other. So these annual boring ASEAN meetings have a, play a very important role in improving the chemistry uh, of the larger region. So that's what ASEAN should be doing more of uh, in the years to come. So for example, the annual East Asian summits that are held when uh, President Obama comes and when President Xi Jinping comes are very important meetings because it provides opportunities for the United States and Chinese leaders to talk to each other directly and the more they talk to each other directly, face to face, like you and I are talking to each right. other, that makes a huge difference. So that's why we have to work harder to create more such opportunities for the leaders to meet. There is definitely a possibility of America becoming number three. In fact, the uh, former chief economist uh, of the Goldman Sachs, Jim O'Neill, has said by 2050, the number one economy of the world will be China, mm -hmm. the number two will be India, and number three will be United States of America. But that will happen only in 2050. So possibly not in my lifetime, but definitely in your lifetime. They live in a much more connected world. 
You know, the, the young people don't understand this old obsession with national boundaries because they're very globalized. They pick up their smartphone and they're immediately connected to New York or London or Paris or anywhere in the world. They don't understand all these national boundaries and they are, feel far more in common uh, with other young people uh, with their smartphones who are either uh, you know, on Facebook or, or in uh, uh, Twitter and so on and so forth. So they live in a different universe. They live in a world which is much more interconnected and which is coming. So I think with more and more of them coming to power in the next few decades, I'm actually more optimistic that they will understand that we need to work together to save our planet. We've seen it being employed in places like Iraq and Afghanistan by the coalition forces. Um, again, it, they tend to be used in areas where they think there's a very high probability of enemy uh, uh, um, troops. Um, they employ robotics in places where they think there's going to be a high probability that their own people are going to be injured, so the principle of force protection comes in. So what they tend to do is they, they tend to send the robotics in first to ensure that the area is clean, to, to ensure that the area uh, is, 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 is free of enemy combatants. And if the areas the, if there are enemy combatants in the area, then those robotics will help to pinpoint the specific locations of these enemy combatants. You can subsequently then uh, deploy military forces to, 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 to either capture or kill those enemy combatants and use it in a manner that ensures that your own people uh, face the lowest possible amount of risk. So it's already happening. We've seen it in Afghanistan, we've seen it in Iraq. It's not just on the land, we see it in the air as well. Um, there's such, there, 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 there are technologies like micro, uh, 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 micro uh, aerial vehicle, uh, vehicles. Um, it's basically a handheld device. It's not fundamentally different from the, uh, from the, from the, from the, um, from the, um, toy planes that people, that people bring out into the field and, 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 and they fly around. Um, and again, because you, you mount a camera on these devices, they, they give you an aerial view of the immediate space just in front of you and you, you can have a clear sense of where enemy combatants might be. Um, these things are all happening already as it is. A lot of armed forces um, already employ or deploy these kinds of devices um, from large to the very small. At the same time, I don't think you'll ever remove humans altogether from that. Uh, number one, or even a drone has to be piloted by a human, at least for the moment. So that human may be far away from the, battle, from the battlefield itself, but he, but he or she is involved in one form or another. At the same time, you tend to know you've won because, well, um, your enemy was there yesterday, but today you've taken over that piece of terrain, right? You've put your flag down there. Um, you need boots on the ground, as it were. So I don't see, I don't think you're going to see humans being removed altogether. That having been said, there's some potentially interesting and potentially very disturbing developments, I would argue, in the area of artificial intelligence. It's clearly something that um, technologists are fascinated with and are trying to move as much towards. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea at all. This idea of automated systems, um, 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 making decisions about who, about who lives, who dies, without that human person Act, being the one who actually makes that particular decision, I don't think that's a, I don't think that 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 would be a good idea.